Flame Over Terra, Chapter 8. The warriors camped at last in the tree-scattered fields below the fort of Daichu, coming there in the cool of an evening when mist filled the valleys and crept up in white wreaths to obscure their view of the high hill of the dun, and the small thatched dwellings dotted all over its lower slopes. Kian stared at it over the misty distance, and his intent face was puzzled. There is too much silence, he said at last. Unless they are altogether dolts, and this man Daichu is not, they must be aware of our coming. There is neither light nor sound nor any sign of their defense. Around him, his captains stared with him, coming, combing the distant slope. They walked up and down the dusky fields, peering through the soft mist, and the yellow of their tunics was an aching brilliance in the dead light. It is odd enough, said one, that the dun itself is silent, nor does anyone come forth to parley. He lifted a hand toward the great bulk of the buildings, crowning the distant wrath. But are we to believe that every dweller in these homesteads near at hand is either dead or sleeping at this hour of the evening? There is neither fire nor light in any one of them. Kian drew down thoughtful brows, and from a little way apart, Labron watched him, and Cessin said with him, and softly and softly Cessnan spoke of his own idea for, of the reasons for the silence. Daichu is now a man of Patrick's God, he said, and would therefore have care for all the people who follow Patrick, whether they belong to his tribe or not. All those who have come of late in the footsteps of the priests and built here around the slopes of his dun, all these will be as precious to him now as if they were his own people. He will have gathered them into the dun and will protect them with his life. He spoke with calm and certainty, and in the failing foggy light, Labram looked at him with curiosity and wondered how he could be so sure. But before he had time to speak, Kian had come to his own conclusions. He has gathered every soul from these slopes into the wrath, he said, beckoning his captains close around him, and they are many. See all these dwellings over the lower slopes? They are the huts of those who follow this man. From the sea, and in addition to his own warriors and his household, the man Daichu has gathered them all inside to defend his dun. The battle will be bloody, my brothers, and desperate, for do not underestimate this, Dai Chu. We will attack in the morning. The clammy mist lay damp on their faces and beaded the long, limp curls of their hair. But through the moist gloom, the captains peered at one another, and the grins were broad across their faces, for there was nothing in this world more to their taste than a desperate and bloody battle with the heads of beaten dead piled on the battlefield, and the Santa Chi to take his heart beside the campfire when all was done, and sing to them all their brave and glorious deeds, making a poem of their killing that they could hand down to their children and their children's children, and on forever as long as men were brave. They stamped their chilly feet in the long, wet grass and rubbed their hands in pleasure. This is good news to my men, cried Keithan, who was called of the bright face. They grow soft with nothing but plowshare in their hands. Loskin's crooked teeth were white and brilliant in the dying light, a broad grin exposing all their twisted fangs, but Loskin said no word. Tenna of the long arms finger fingered his sword and stared toward the dun. It is well, he said. There will be a pile of heads this time tomorrow, rising like the wrath itself. Kian had not threats or pleasure. This was his business and his task for the king, but this time it was also a task for himself. There is but one head I care about, the Avenger said coldly, and tomorrow night I will sleep with it beneath my knee. Now we will sleep for tonight, brothers, and gather our strength for the good work of the morning. He took one last look at the vast, shadowy bulk of the dun lith glass, sinking now into the foggy darkness. Every man will sleep tonight with his weapons at his hand. Every weapon... At his hand, Kian ordered, it was the custom of the men to sleep in camp with one light weapon by their sides and the others piled under guard for easy seizure in the morning. Tonight, said Kian again, they will sleep with one eye and every weapon. 
Were I the man who holds the fort up on that hill, I would not let this army sleep tonight. Sesson took his head slowly, quite certain that Daichu would never attack by surprise or otherwise because Patrick would not let him, especially if he had any knowledge as to why this army was camped below the hill. Not even when they attacked in the morning would he defend himself if he knew what was at stake. Even more than at any time in the previous days, Sesson's thoughts were numb and dead, struggling to understand that the morning would bring the threatened slaughter and that it was all the outcome of Patrick's gentle words in his own distant home. Kian came up to them in the flame-shot darkness. Sleep in what peace you may get, my father, he said to Labron, looking at Sesson not at all. Behind him, the misty, fi misty firelight ringed his head with drifting pink, and they could not see his face. Sleep as you may. Tomorrow there will be blood, but first we will get the little Maha. But if we do not get her alive and well, there will be a red slaughter such as Aaron has never known. Labron did not answer him, staring through the darkness in the direction of the dun, which they could no longer see, blinded by the light of their own fires. If she is there, he said softly to himself as Kian moved away, I could go get her and none would be the wiser and there would be no need for slaughter. Beside him, Sesnan heard his soft voice. And I could get Bennett, he added. Labrum turned to him in surprise. In all this business, it had not occurred to him that Sesnan had a hostage up there in the dark dun, just as dear as Maha was to him. Yes, he said now, you could get Bennett. But it is too late, added Sesnan hopelessly. Now it is the king's business. Yes, answered Labram, now it is the king's business. He turned sharply to his cousin in the dim red light. Do you not, do not think that Sesnan, he, he said firmly, that I could have done otherwise than to take it to the king. I have as little stomach for it now as yourself. For I have no... I have small hope that we will get these children out before the fighting, but we of Leary's household do not have private troubles, or if we do, we may have them in poverty away from the king. We are Leary's, and so are our smallest affairs. Sesnan struggled to be reasonable. I did not think otherwise, my cousin, he said. They were talking now almost to keep their spirits up and against a growing silence as the warriors finished up such food as they had brought and wrapped themselves in their cloaks to sleep, sheltering as much as possible under the trees and bushes from the creeping mists. But for Labram and his elderly cousin, there was no sleep, even when their desultory conversation stopped. They sat huddled in their freeze cloaks through the night before, the des before a deserted fire, staring hopelessly into its embers. Seeing nothing in its glowing heart but pictures of the morning when they might get Maha back, but there would be no concern for Bennett, and death could take a thousand others whose lives were just as precious. When in the early morning they awoke from fitful dozing, there was nothing left in the clear light of the mist that had wrapped the night. Wearily and in silence, they stood up and stretched themselves and straightened their crumpled cloths as trumpets blared to rouse the men. A moment later, Kian was at their side. You have slept, my father, he asked courteously. And Labron answered as levelly as he might, as they might had. Now, my father, the young men went on and his face was expressional, expressionless, <laughs> expressionless. You will stay in a safe place well behind the warriors and the fighting. I will spare a couple of my warriors to protect you and your kinsmen. The words were perfectly smooth and civil, but to the older men, their meaning was clear. Despite Bree's fears, they were at the moment no more than hostages who must not interfere with the business of the king. There was no danger of Labran being allowed to fight. Surprisingly, it was the meek and gentle Cessnan who rebelled. It would not be in my mind to run away, young man, he said cold, coldly, facing Kian and offering him no title of respect. My son is there in the dun of Daichu, and I would not be likely to forsake him in this hour. That is, if you and your brave warriors leave him in any need of my care. Kian was surprised, staring at Cessnan and overlooking the lack of respect. He had not thought the old one himself to be involved in this, but merely guilty of neglect in allowing Maha to be stolen. Your son, he asked, 
and seemed to see Cessnan for the first time as a person and not merely as the nameless object of his anger. Your son, how old is he? And he was stolen also? Maha was not stolen, Cessnan repeated it patiently yet once more. She went off, she went of her own accord. I only failed in my duty in that I did not stop her. He paused. My son, he said, is 11 years. I gave him to the Roman priest with all my heart. You gave him? I gave him because I believed in Patrick. Keon was no blind, unlettered killer. Nobly bred of high intelligence, he was quick to begin to sense that there was more in this than he had first at, at first understood. His mind clouded with anger at the loss of Maha, but now, like Labram, he was in the king's hands and taken up with the king's business, and there was no time left to pause and question what he did. He only stood for a moment looking at Cessnan, his blue eyes resting dark and thoughtful on his face, and then he turned and stared out through the tent flaps at the hill of Daichu. Around the camp, as the bronze trumpets flared the lightning sky, men to the lightning sky, men were rising like ghosts from the sodden grass, shaking the sleep from their eyes and rolling up their cloaks and reaching for their weapons. There is no time now for talking, Keon said briefly, and Labrum thought he caught the shadow of regret on the young face. Remember to do as I have bidden you. He turned without further words to where his squires waited for him, one with his axe and his round blue shield, the leather handhold ready to his grip, and the heavy silvered belt of the answerer. The second held his banner high and bright upon a pole to be carried over his head. While he buckled on his sword and slid his palm through the grip of his shield, the two older men watched and did not speak. But as he moved away to join his captains, they moved too, aimlessly across the field, pretending not to notice the two armed warriors who closed in behind them. They ignored the crowding men who pushed and grumbled, mustering to the bright banners and stood in silence looking across the waking land toward the hill of Daichu. On this steep, on this side, a steep set steady slope up to the tree-grown rafts that defended its crest inside the gray teeth of a ring of standing stones. In the fortress at the top, there was still an utter stillness and no sign of life, rather as though everybody there was even yet asleep and oblivious of the enemy at their gates. I do not understand, said Labrum, and his fair hair was rumpled by the restless fingers he kept di dragging through it as he stood to watch. I do not understand. Will they not defend themselves? Why are they not moving? They must know this army is here. The same problem was troubling Keon, where he stood among his captains. It's it is as though we would attack a grave mound, he said uneasily, with all those we hope to kill already dead. Like Labron, he stood and stared toward the dun, but in his trained body there was no restlessness. It was this unearthly stillness and silence that made him anxious, not for himself, but for an unease which he could not feel behind him. Which but for an unease which he could feel behind him, slowly creeping through his men, most of whom were also standing now as he him, he was himself staring at the dun with growing expressions of doubt and fear. Kian knew without a backward glance that this was so, and knew also that this fear of something they did not understand could sap their will to fight and lose a battle before ever a sword was drawn. If there was no life in the dun, then life must come from him. He swirled away from his captains, moving swiftly through the men to rouse them and stir them to vitality, crying out his orders for the attack to take place as soon as he himself had taken up position. Sluggishly, they turned to follow him, their eyes still clinging to the dun. But before he had gone ten paces, Kethlin's voice was lifted to follow him. My lord, Kion, someone comes. Someone has left the dun. Kion turned back and felt the whole mess of men around him move with a long stirring sigh, whether of relief or what he could not guess. No doubt it was relief to them to see the situation returning to the shape they knew. Something was, someone was coming out from the fort to parley. This was normal and this they understood. They come, said Loskin greedily, and his crooked fangs scraped his lips as he talked. They come to ask for mercy. Let them seek it, seek it elsewhere. We have none to give. It need not be so, Kethan answered. It may be that they come to make terms for the battle. 
Kian's eyes were more thoughtful, and his hand crept to the answerer's ivory hilt. It may be, he said, watching, that they will challenge to a single combat to save their dun. He tried to keep the rising hope out of his voice. Never before in all his days had he felt such a creeping distaste for a battle as was growing on him for this one. Even though he despised himself for his weakness and stamped on his feelings, lest in the strange way that such things happen, they would spread him from himself through his men. He could not shake off this growing feeling that there was nothing here for a king to fight about. Nothing but one child run away and easily brought back. And another here, it seemed, with all his father's heart. Both might die. <laughs> Sorry, my, my thing's doing, uh, my phone's picking stuff up. Nothing but one child run away and easily brought back, and another here, it seemed, with all his father's heart. Both might die, and who then would be avenged? Wearily, he knew there was more to it than this in the eyes of the king. Leary saw this Roman as a threat and to Aaron and wanted him destroyed as the occasion of the stolen girl was merely seized upon as an excuse. It was not for his avenger to question who might die in bloody battle as he carried out his orders, but Kian could not free himself from the memory of Sensen's sad and quiet face as he told him of his son. The man was only a lesser chief, but he had some dignity that could not be gainsaid. Kian's whole spirit lifted hopefully to see the small figures on the distant hill. Little could be seen of them yet, save that there was one all dressed in white and another in saffron tunic of a warrior. The third was very small. Kian figured the hilt of his sword and rehearsed the formal words with which he would accept for himself the challenge to single combat. In this way, he alone could go out there and fight for his young bride. She would come safely home and the king's honor would be avenged and that poor creature with Labim could go in peace back to his dun with his son if he wanted him. Beyond Kian, the warriors broke apart protestingly to allow the rush of Sensen and Labrin from their places at the back, followed by their two angry guards who would not be left behind. My lord, Kian, Sessin could hardly speak in his haste and excitement, lifting an arm in its crumpled sleeve to point up across the fields toward the group and gasping and swallowing to find his voice. My lord, Kian, it is he. It is Adez, head himself. Speak with him, my lord, and I promise you all will be well. Kian did not even notice that in his answer he acknowledged his reluctance for the battle. There is a warrior with him. It may be a challenge to combat. That will be the man Daichu, but that is Patrick. See the light in the disc above his brow? His arm fell and his voice with it, and his face grew gentle, and the child with him, he said, that is my son, Bennett. They all looked together at the man advancing down the hill, and even as they watched, the sun reached him and struck a blaze of dazzling gold above his forehead. Adez's head is coming, said Sensen, and this time Labran did not look impatient. Speak with him, my sons, he said to Kian. There is no honor lost in parley. Kian appeared to make up his mind. He turned to them with the firm voice of a commander and the uncertainty gone from his face. True, he said, there is no honor lost, and I thank you for your advice. Now, Labran, my father, will, you will come with me and also your kinsmen. Also you, my Kethan of the bright face, and you, Tian Tina, and your squires and the banners. The rest of you will wait and watch with all your eyes, and at the very smell of treachery, then you, Laskin, will order the attack. He glanced up once more at the open fields crowned by the vast mound of the dun. I do not forget our open position at the feet of this man, he said, but I will trust his wand of peace. Daichu is a man of Aaron, though we know nothing of the Roman. Thus he argued with himself, but nevertheless set out firmly over the fields, followed by his bidden men, the green and blue scarlet of their banners, sharp and brilliant in the young light, and their footsteps black in the disturbed dew. At the foot of the hill, Patrick and his companions halted and stood to wait for them to come, and behind them, Loskin and the warriors watched and waited, and over all the green-gold plain there was silence, a puzzled patience." Kian marched fast and steadily 
so that the older legs of Sensen had to struggle to keep pace. But as they advanced toward the stream, it was Bennett who could not wait at the last moment from the formal greetings proper to the parlay, rushing to the very edge of the water, ankle deep among the king cups. At Kian's party, as Kian's party halted on the other side. Greetings, father, he cried, staggering for his foothold on the sloping bank and laughing full of happy confidence that with his father and his father in God come together, there could be no danger in spite of all the warriors. Greetings, my father, we didn't expect you here. The tall warrior beside Patrick stepped forward, freeing a hand from the leather leash of the two great wolfhounds to move him back, speaking to him. Bennett looked up at him and then moved back to his place and composed himself again, but he could not quench the beaming smile he turned on his father. Since his tired face was crumpled with happiness, okay, yep, was crumpled with happiness as he lifted a hand toward the child and smiled back at him, but he did not speak, knowing what was right. He left the forward place and the first words to Kian, whose squire carried the white wand of parley. Beside Patrick, the other warrior stepped forward, his two huge dogs quiet at his hand, and he faced Kian across the brown bubbling waters and the yellow flowers of the little stream. Labron, watching, felt a breath of wonder stir in him at the sight of two such men. Daichu was somewhat older than the king's avenger, a little taller and as dark as Kian was fair, but both were mighty creatures, perfect in the pride of their youth and strength. The weight of the shield and sword and heavy axe as light as children's baubles to their hands. The sun on their long hair and their yellow kilts fluttering to the morning wind. Across the narrow water, they stared at each other in hostility and suspicion. Who are you? cried Daichu. The huge dogs moved restlessly at the loudness of his voice and his squires drew close behind him in the moment of challenge. Who are you and where do you come from? If I must fight you, stranger, then tell me the cause of our battle. Who are you, man of the bright hair, and what brings you with an army to my gates? He was understandably hostile, but his voice, too, was genuinely puzzled, and the priest be beside him looked long at the weary and tousled Sensen and the company he kept, and was obviously puzzled as Daichu himself. Kian answered them, not of the bright hair, he shouted, but of the bright axe, Kian of bright axe, O Daichu, avenger to Liri, high king of all Aaron, I am at your gates to seek vengeance for an insulted offer to the king. Now Daichu and Patrick looked truly astonished and turned to stare at each other as though asking by all they believed in what this thing could be about. Bennett peered from face to face on the first on first one side, then the other, trying to decide if the conversation could, should concern him. What insult is this, Dai Chu cried. I know of no way in which I have given insult to the king. State your complaint, champion, and I will answer it with my blood if need be. It is not you who have offended the king directly, but the man of strange faith who stands there at your side. And as you have sheltered him, then guilt is also yours. Ah, said Patrick. He stood a little more erect and faced across to his accuser as he moved the young sun gleamed in the Adez blade and flashed a thousand points of brilliance from his crozier. Beyond the stream, Kian blinked in the bright dazzle of gold and resisted the strange thought that suddenly the man on the other bank had seemed to grow a little larger. If it is I, cried Patrick in his clear measure and his clear measured voice reached back through the quiet morning almost to the watching warriors. He planted his crozier firmly on the ground as if to give strength to what he said. If it is I, then tell me what I have done. I can meet my own charges in the name of my God. Kian turned and laid a hand on Labran's arms, arm, drawing him a little forward. Labran, of long memory, is chief horn to the high king of Aaron. What touches him touches the king also. Above the forked brown beard, the mild face of Patrick was utterly bewildered. <clears throat> Friend, he said, I have never seen this man before. No, but you have seen his child sent in legal fosterage to the dun of the chieftain Cessnan and stolen by you when you left the dun. Hopelessly, like an echo, Cessnan said as he had said at all times, she was not stolen. She went of her own wish. 
No one heard him except Kion, who looked at him a moment and faltered. As though to hold his position at all, he must tell the facts as he thought them and allow no argument. He turned back across the stream, taking his great axe from the hands of his squire. His feet wide planted in the flowering grass, he took a deep breath and lifted it above his head. I charge you, he cried, for the crime of stealing the daughter of Labran, to defend yourself as best you can from the vengeance of the king, both you and those who have sheltered you, but first you will deliver up the girl. Bennett's face was small with anxiety as he listened across the small dancing stream. His eyes were on his father. A couple of times he lifted his desperate face to Patrick as if he was about to speak, for there was no doubt now that the conversation did concern him and very closely. <clears throat> the priest's face was a mask of honest bewilderment, and he shook his head as though to clear it, and the light moved back and forth above his brow. Dai Chu's looks had grown black as thunder, responding at once to the threat of the brandished axe, ready to fight on the spot if need be, without waiting to understand the cause. It was enough that this fair-haired fellow, king's champion or whoever he was, should stand here on his land and threaten him for something he had never done. He moved toward his squire as if to exchange the dog leash for his arms, and quietly Patrick moved a step in front of him. Peace, I chew, my friend. In God's name, peace. We have not stayed dark and silent all the night in order to prevent attack, simply that we may lose our tempers in the morning and fight over something we don't understand. He lifted his voice to Kian over the stream. Now tell me, friend or enemy, whichever you may be, what child is this you speak of? The daughter of Labran, the high king's Brihon. Patrick bent his head and the gesture was too humble for conscious patience, but Labran felt as if they were rebuked. This I understand, Patrick went on, and where the others shouted across the stream, his clear voice carried with no effort. But when or where have I taken her from her parents? The only child I know I took with me from the dun of Cessna is the boy Bennett, and he was given to God with a full heart. He looked over at Cessna and laid a hand on the boy's head, but Bennett did not look in the least blessed by the gesture. With every word of talk, his face was growing more and more unhappy, dark and embarrassed with a certain shadow of guilt. Bennett could keep quiet no longer. With one last glance at his father, he turned to Patrick, his face scarlet up to his springing curls and his fingers twisting wildly in the tassels of his girdle. His thin treble was like a bird in the silence. My father and God, he blurted out, I know of her. I have caused all of this. He waved a frantic hand at the masked silent warriors on the plain and the fringe of people that now crowned the wraths of Dai Chu. I have caused all this. I alone knew that Ma I alone knew what Maha did, and I didn't tell my father. I know where she is now.